The Jesus freaks have something that we need. Now, we have a lot that they need, but they have something that we need. They got it from the hippies, and the hippies have something that we need. And I'm not for communal living, neither am I for wearing dirty blue jeans and long shaggy hair. Neither am I for the kind of public demonstration that the crowds make. But there is something, something of a self-abandonment that they have that most Christians don't have. Listen to me for a minute. Do you know why there is a Jesus freak movement in America? Because the churches just haven't meant business for God. I mean, we've gone, gone about our business and we've had our church service on Sunday morning. And a handful of folks have come back on Sunday night. But we've just honestly... The thing that has, has killed America in, in many respects is the formal Sunday morning church service. The average person has, the average Christian, he thinks he's done his duty. He comes to worship God on Sunday morning. Fly across America as I do. Look down and, <clears throat> and see <clears throat> little towns from the sky. Young folks, you listen to me while I'm preaching. Every one of you, and you said your last word tonight in the service. Every one of you listen. <clears throat> Look down in the sky and see what I see. A little cluster of houses, looks like a toy box, and in the midst of that is a building, maybe two, with a steeple. And that's the house where the people in that neighborhood come once a week, and they look up toward the sky and say, God, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you are, we worship you. They walk out the doors. They go home, and that's the extent of their Christianity. Oh, they drop a dollar or two in the collection plate while they're there, but that's about it. Now, the honest truth is, if somebody has anything that's even near to real, in most towns, they've got to find it outside a church. Because the average church in this country doesn't have one nickel's worth of reality in the pew or the pulpit. Not one nickel's worth. I've said this before, and you've heard me say it. I go places across this country, and Jesus freaks come up to me. And when I say Jesus freak, that's the term they use, or Jesus people. And they say to me, if you'll come to our area and start a church, we'll be normal. We'll join your church. We're having no problem in our high school department. For example, uh, we have a, a high school department for bus High schoolers, things growing like wildfire. And the junior high department, too. Growing like wildfire. How many haircuts did we have this morning, fellas? Dave, where are you? How many haircuts? We had 13 haircuts. We have barbers in our high school bus department. We gave 13 haircuts this morning. We said, how do you do it? We have a straight jacket over there. No, I'm talking about now, these are, these are fellows that come to our church and they get saved and they voluntarily uh, get a haircut, look like human being, beings again. Now, in most towns, if they get anything at all, they've got to get it somewhere outside the church because there's no church like this that means business for God. Now, listen to me, listen to me. This country is crumbling because Christian people, I mean God's people, I mean the churches, have just piddled. Just piddled. Last night, I got home somewhere a little before midnight. Dave was in a talking mood, and he wanted to talk to, tell me about some of the kids. You just would have a hard time believing what's going on. Right here in First Baptist Church Hammond, with a bunch of... I mean, a bunch of little hoodlum teenagers. 
their lives are being transformed. I mean, the people say, well, Chicago is the hardest place in the world to build a church. That's foolishness. It's foolishness. Well, the boys told me last night, uh, two, two boys did. They said, they said uh, preacher, uh, the, the truth is, it's just like picking ripe fruit off a tree to go over in the Chicago area. Now, why has it been hard to reach? I don't know why it's been hard to reach. Some guys come with a, with a starchy kind of sermon, with the choir singing the sevenfold amen, and uh, the glory of pottery. I'm not sure what that is, but the glory of pottery. I heard it one time. I heard about it one time. And, uh, and a bunch of people come, have a formal worship service on Sunday morning where nobody's ever changed and no life is ever transformed and nothing miraculous ever takes place and the world is sick of that kind of stuff. Of course you won't reach Chicago with it. The honest, simple... Listen, the young man stood right here Thursday night on our nationwide radio broadcast. Teenager. I'm guessing what... Uh, uh, where's... Um, uh, Got the name of the fellow, Murphy, 16 years of age. Sit right here. Tom Murphy, one of our boys, went over to the north side of Chicago, the park. Was it Grant Park? One of those parks along the shore drive there? Park. And a bunch of kids had a football game. And Tom stopped the game. One of this 16, uh, 16-year-old boy to Christ. And I asked the 16-year-old boy, I, I asked him, well, look, how did you feel about stopping the game? He said, not bad. We were losing anyway. And I, I asked, well, how did you feel? Uh, here comes the fellow up and, and uh, talks to you about getting saved. Did, didn't that sort of, uh, sort of rub the fur the wrong way? He said, no. I wanted to get saved. I wanted to get saved. And I, I asked him, I said, well, well, how did you want to get saved? He said, because he had been over there a day or two before and won my buddy to Christ. And my buddy had told me how good you felt when you get saved. And I wanted to have what my buddy had. Don't you see what I'm saying? Brother, when, when, when it's real, folks will listen to you. That's why the building's full tonight. This, this church is not popular. And we get, like, we get cussing and criticized and we're hated. I know it. A fellow walked to my office this morning and he said, I lost my job. He's a college student. He said, I lost my job. And by the way, if you have a job for him, he'd like to talk to you. But uh, see me and I'll point you in his direction. But I lost my job. I said, why? He said, I witnessed on the job too much. And I said, now look, while you're working, you shouldn't witness. You ought to, ought to work. Witness before you go to work or after you get through. But you shouldn't witness on the other fellow's time. And, uh, and uh, work hard and be a good employee well, while, you're, while you're on your own uh, or the, uh, the employer's time. And he said, I, I didn't witness. Uh, he said, I did it before or after. But I told him I went to Hiles Anderson College. And he said, oh, you're that crowd, huh? They got together and lied about him and said he, oh, forgot, said he found him asleep on the job and lied about him. And he got fired. I know what folks think about us. But they said, well, I don't care what you think. You get mad. You walk out the door and never walk back in here again. And you lie and cuss and say what you want to say. But, brother, there's something real going on inside these walls. There's something real here. And that's why folks are coming. Folks walk in the doors back there that wouldn't, listen, that wouldn't admit they were here. But folks who hate us six days a week come to hear us on Sunday. Why? Because I'm a good preacher, not on your life. Because uh, we have good music, not on your life. This old world is sin sick and this world is heart sick for somebody who knows God and makes Him real to people. And that's why we have the hippie crowd, the Jesus freak crowd. I'll be honest with you. I know some towns, if I lived in them and had to choose, I'd, I'd run to the Jesus Freak crowd rather than go to the starchy churches in town. Our country is going to hell, and the reason she is, because of God's people, just going through the motions. Folks right here tonight, Jesus doesn't mean a thing in the world to you. There are folks here tonight, you walk out those doors and you won't read your Bible between now and next Sunday morning. You won't bow your knee to pray one time between now and next Sunday morning. You will let folks curse the name of Jesus Christ on the job and you will never say one good word about Him. And you live like the heathen live, buying and selling and eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, just living for self and living for me and living just like the heathen live. This country could be saved if God's people would just be real. Just be real. 
Now, how do you make it real? You make it real when you come to the place with the Apostle, with the Apostle Paul who said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul could have gloried in his past. Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle says, Though I might have also confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherewith of he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Paul said, I gave up all these things for Jesus Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done. What's that? Garbage. What Paul said, I was a man of social standing. I, I counted garbage. I gave it up. Paul said, I was a man with a great future. I counted garbage. I gave it up. Paul said, I was a man of the elite. But I counted garbage. I gave it up. Paul said, my family was on the social standing, but I counted garbage. I gave it up. Paul said, I was going up the ladder in the Sanhedrin. I counted garbage. I gave it up. He said, all of it. Why? He said, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know why we don't know God? We're trying to hang on to the world one hand and hang on to God with the other. We're like the, these little lizards we used to have down in Texas. They change colors according to what, what colors around them. I mean, we, we, we want to be just as popular as the world is, and yet, no God, you can't do it, brother. We want to dress like the world dresses, and yet, no God, you can't do that. We want to wear our hair like the world wears their hair, and no God. We want to go where the world goes. We want to go to the same movies. We want to go to the same dances. We want to use the same lingo. We want to have the same music the world has. And yet, by some hocus-pocus form of magic, we want to come to a church for a couple of hours a week and learn to know God. You don't do it that way. You take all of life's dreams and throw them in the garbage can for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You take your own personal ambition and throw them in the garbage can. Count them as done for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, I long for the people in this church to give everything to God. Everything to God. All to Jesus, I surrender. We sing it, and we sing it, and we sing it. It means almost nothing to us. Come to the place in our lives where we say with the Apostle Paul, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but accounted as garbage for Jesus Christ. I was circumcised the eighth day. I was, I was in every way a high-class kind of a kid, but accounted it garbage for Jesus Christ. I was on the Sanhedrin, or studying for the Sanhedrin, but accounted it garbage for Jesus Christ. And look what he got. He got the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now you listen to me for a minute. If you could ever one day in your life, just one day in your life, come to know God long enough to go to bed that night and say, I'll walk with God today, you wouldn't care anymore whether you're popular or not. The average person in this house has never gone to bed at night and been able to say, honestly, today I knew God. Oh, you're saved. I know that. You've trusted Christ. But you don't know God any more than I know Spiro Agnew. I mean, I, 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 if he runs for president, I'll vote for him. Uh, because I'm for him and also because the, the other crowd that puts up a man every year, I wouldn't vote for them as Charlie Brown running against them. I mean, I mean, you're saved. You trusted Jesus. But you never have gone to bed at night and said, I walk with God today. I knew God today. All for some people who know Him. All for some people who walk alone if needs be, but they know God. They walk with Him and they know Him. I mean, they know Him. Paul said, I was, I'm, I'm saved. But he said, I came the time in my life where I got the garbage can out and I put... I put my heritage in the garbage can, and I put my race in the garbage can, and I put my religion in the garbage can, and I put my profession in the garbage can, and I put my future in the garbage can, and I put my social standing in the garbage can. Paul said, I did it. Why, Paul? Why? Paul said, I want to know Jesus Christ, the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The longer I live, and the more I walk with God, the more fed up I get with the flesh. 
I mean, I mean, just little. Most of us, we live just to talk and chat, call somebody on the telephone, and, and read some newspaper, and read some magazine, and watch uh, John's other wife on television, or, or Secret Storm, or the, or the, the public hurricane, or, and, and watch the television program, and then turn the radio on right quick, and listen to that call-in program, and see if they're going to talk about how's this time. And uh, we just go from one to the other, just just enjoying selves and, and talking a little bit, and we'll gossip a little bit, and we'll criticize somebody a little bit, and read some more magazine, and, and, and then go, go out and go talk to somebody a while longer, and just chit-chat and, uh, and fellowship one with the other. And most of us never one hour ever walk with God. And if anybody ever does decide to walk with God, everybody thinks she's nuts or thinks he's nuts. Paul said, I want to know Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm willing to put everything else in the garbage can. I don't, uh, I don't claim to have apprehended. I don't claim to be all I want to be and all I ought to be. But I never did begin to know God till I started giving up some things that I wanted. I recall when my, the president of my college, when I graduated, called me on the telephone. He said, I want to have, have dinner. I want to have lunch with you today at, or tomorrow or next Tuesday or sometime at the uh, Baker Hotel in Dallas. Dr. H. D. Bruce, president of my college, where I graduated, sat across the de- table from me and he said, Jack, he said, I'm going to tell you something. And I was shocked to death. He said, you're one of the two outstanding young men ever graduated from East Texas Baptist College. Now, not my grades. My grades weren't that good. Because I was preaching every night somewhere, and I'd take all the cuts I was allowed. To, I was preaching revivals and so forth. And, and, uh, but I, he said, he said you, uh, Tim Trammell, he said, Tim Trammell and you are the outstanding students that have ever attended East Texas Baptist College. Now, he said, Jack, we want to honor you. We want you to come back to the school and be honored by your school. But he said, if we do, <clears throat> you're going to have to change your style of preaching a little bit. Now he said, go ahead and hate sin, but don't call it by name. Don't stomp so loud when you talk about it. He said, we want to honor you. He said, you, now forgive me, I'm, I sound like I'm bragging. I'm really not. But he said, you, holding your hand the hope of East Texas Baptist College influencing this country. And we want you to come back and be a part of our family. But he said, you will have to trim." And I got up from the table and I said, Dr. Bruce, I'm not going to change my preaching one whit. Not one whit. He shook his head and he says, you're the same old Jack. And I said, thank you. I think I know what you mean. If it means I haven't changed, I, I, I thank you. And I hope under God, I said, I hope under God, if, it's wrong, if sin is wrong tonight, it, it's wrong tomorrow, it'll be wrong the next day. And I said, come back 20 years from now. And I hope under God I'm still preaching against sin just like I do tonight. What happened? I can go on the campus of the school where I graduated, and they won't even ask me to lead in prayer. I came to the place in my denomination's life where I couldn't support the mission program and the schools that were liberal. And I decided not to give a dime. And by the way, I, not one dime is going to come from this pocket to support any dirty school that allows the Fosdicks and the Buttricks and the Norman Vincent Peels and all the rest of them to come and shake the faith of young preachers who ought to be hearing God's men bring the message of God. And so I decided I couldn't do it. And they gave me a choice. Either you support the work or you won't belong to our group. And I took my denomination and tossed it in the garbage can. I tossed my school in the garbage can. Over 13 years ago, I tossed my state in the garbage can. Now, that's getting serious when you come from Texas. But I'll tell you what. I didn't ever really know God. Now, I was saved, but I didn't know God until I came to a place in my life where I decided to count everything else but loss. All of it but loss. Paul said, I determined, God forbid, that I should glory... In nothing save the cross 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul could have gloried in his past. Paul could have gloried in his sufferings. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and other passages, he lists his sufferings. How that he was uh, beaten so many times, and he was shipwrecked so many times, and he was... And he was in jail so many times. And how he was in prison. And how he was hated. And all the things that happened. Paul could have said, I have glory in the suffering that I have done for Jesus Christ. But Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul could have glory in his revelations. In chapter 12 of Second Corinthians, he told about the time when he was called up into the third heaven. And Paul said, I could glory. But he said, lest I be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Paul could have gloried in what he saw in his revelation. He could have gloried in his sufferings. He could have gloried in his past. He could have gloried in his education. Paul said, I'm going to glory in the cross of Christ. But now, wait a minute. Notice, he didn't say, I glory in Christ. He said, I glory in the cross of Christ. Paul didn't say, God, that I should glory save in the incarnation of our Savior. The incarnation was wonderful. My, 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 Christmas is coming. And I get a little weary of Christmas time, us talking about a little baby born in, in Bethlehem. And the, the average kid, all they know is that 2,000 years ago, a little baby was there in a manger. And here was Mary. And here's Joseph. 10,000 times more happened than that. God, the eternal, pre-existent God of glory, came, became flesh, and walked among men in Bethlehem's manger. God incarnate. God clothed upon with flesh. Don't be deceived and hoodwinked by the world's attempt to, 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 to direct your attention away from the incarnation toward a little baby in a manger and a woman and a man beside him. God became flesh in Bethlehem. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul could have said, I'd glory in the incarnation, but he didn't. Paul could have said, I'd glory in the life of Christ. Never man lived like he lived. You've heard me say from this pulpit again and again almost every Sunday. Oh, never a bad word came through his lips, and never a bad thought entered his mind, and never a bad thing entered his eyes, and never a bad path was trodden by his feet. The perfect Lamb of God, Paul could have said, I glory in nothing but the life of Jesus Christ. I glory in the fact that He stilled the wave and calmed the storm, caused the dumb to speak and the lame to leap like a heart and the dead to live and the sick to rise. He stilled the storms and calmed the waves and, and blessed the little children and raised the dead. And Paul could have said, He's the sinless Lamb of God. I glory in His life. But Paul didn't say that. Paul could have said, I glory in his resurrection. Ah, his resurrection. You've heard preacher after preacher say it, but still it's true. The Buddhist can take you to a place tonight and say, here lies the body of Buddha. Mohammedans can take you to a place tonight and say, here lies the body of Mohammed. Confucius followers can take you to a spot and say, here lies the body of Confucius. Joseph Smith's followers can take you to a spot and say, here lies the body of Joseph Smith. But twice I've been to a spot where I could say, here was the body of Jesus Christ. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Paul could have said, I glory in his resurrection. Oh, it seems to me that'd be a lot more to glory about than in the cross. It seems that blessed incarnation when angels uh, sang the songs to shepherds watching their flocks by night, when wise men came to the little Christ child and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, when Mary and Joseph looked in the face of God becoming flesh as he was in the manger and all of heaven still to a holy hush as they looked down and saw God becoming flesh. What a glorious thing in which to glory. Or oh, the wonderful life of our Lord as he lived among men and walked as the perfect Son of God. Walked with sinners but never sinned. Walked with liars but never lied. Walked with murders but never murdered. Walked with thieves but never stole. Walked with bad folks but never did bad. Walked with haters but never hated. Walked with those who cursed but never cursed. Walked with those who did wrong but never wronged. Paul could have said, I glory in that kind of a life, but he didn't. Paul could have said, I glory in the resurrection, that empty tomb, but he didn't. Paul could have said, I glory in the ascension. Oh, we, we don't say enough about the ascension of our Lord. We don't say enough about it. Ah, oh, when Jesus died, all the saved who had ever been saved before he died had gone to a place called paradise, a part of Hades. And there they're awaiting the time when our Lord would, ascend, would descend into the pit of paradise and bring captivity captive. 
And our Lord, when He died, went down to paradise, the division of Hades and paradise, and took those spirits that had been in, in prison in paradise ever since Abel had died. And He lifted them out of the prison and carried them to heaven. And He rose up into heaven to be, be the intercessor and the priest of all those that trust Him. Paul could have said, I'd glory in that, but he didn't. Paul could have said, I'd glory in his second advent. He could have said, I'd glory when I think of the Savior coming in the clouds and those who are dead in Christ rising and we which are alive and remain being caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul could have said, I'd glory in that. Paul could have said, I'd glory in the fact that Jesus is going to be crowned at the judgment seat of Christ when he gives us our crowns and we hurl them at his feet. I'd glory in that. Paul could have said, I glory in the time when Jesus shall come on a white horse and put down the Antichrist and establish a kingdom of peace that will cover the earth with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. And King Jesus shall ascend the royal stairway of Mount Zion, and He shall rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. Men shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And they shall not know war any more. The knowledge of God shall cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. The little child shall play at the hole of the cockatrice den and lead a lion down the street. And old man shall die at a hundred. And folks will say, what a pity. Just a baby died. In that age where sin shall be put down and God's people shall be mayors and presidents and city councilmen. We are on the show for a thousand years. Paul could have said, I'd glory in that. But he didn't say that. Paul said, I'd glory in the cross. For a minute, would you please, would you compare that old bloody cross to that precious empty tomb and wonder why Paul would glory in a bloody cross? Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God suffered and bled and died on dark Calvary. Oh, the cross, Paul gloried not in the ascension, not in the coming of Christ, not in the incarnation, not in his sinless life, but the cross. God's own darling son was nailed to a tree after being scourged with a cat of nine tails and hated and jeered and mocked. Here's the king of glory. Lift up your gates. The king of glory is coming in. Here's the king of glory with no throne but a cross. No crown but a crown of thorns, and no royal scepter but a walking stick, and no robe to wear but a borrowed overcoat. No subjects but a jeering mob. Here's the King of kings and Lord of lords on the cross, and blood running down his face and his hands, and, and a crown of thorns on his head, and those old Middle Eastern thorns down into his brow, and blood running down his cheeks, and a spear in his side, and the blood and water came out of his side, and dogs are licking his wounds, and people laughing and mocking, and suddenly Pilate stands up and says, at this time of the year, we always let some, some prisoner go, some criminal go. On this side, we have a wicked man named Barabbas, and on this side, we have Jesus. I find no fault in him. And so on this side we have a man guilty of sedition. On this side we have Jesus, the sinless one, about whom the centurion said, Surely this was the Son of God. On this side we have a man who's been caught in, 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 uh, in uh, robbery and in, in sedition. On this side we have Jesus, whom shall I let go? And the angry mob cries, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Let Barabbas go! The wicked criminal goes loose while the darling, perfect, sinless Son of God goes to Calvary. See, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet a thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were present far too small? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my love, my all. Paul said, that's my glory. I'd glory in the spittle on his face. I'd glory in the nails in his hands. I'd glory in the crown of thorns on his head. I'd glory in the spear in his side. Why? I'll tell you why. That's the hope of the world. There on the cross. That's the hope. Paul said, I'd glory in that. But now, wait a minute. There are three deaths on this cross. Are you listening? Are you listening? There are three deaths on this cross. Jesus died. The world died. And Paul died. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16 says it. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Three deaths there. Give me just a trifle more volume, please. Three deaths there. 
What? First one, Jesus died. Why did Jesus die? You know, let me, let me, let me have your attention for a minute. We, we have the strangest idea that all Jesus died on the cross for was so we could go to heaven. No, Jesus died on the cross so God could get us back within His righteousness and justice. Did you know that God was happier about Calvary than man was? Did you know that Christ died for God before He died for sinners? Did you know that God had to accept Christ before you had to accept Christ? You could accept Christ all you want to, but unless God accepted Christ and His penalty on Calvary, you'd still be lost in sin. Christ died for God! Father, man has fallen. Yes, I know it, son, and I want him back. I don't know why, but I love him. I love old Adam. I love him. I don't know why I love the old sinner ate the forbidden fruit, but I love him. And I love Eve. I don't know why I love her. She's going to be deceived by the devil, and, and she's going to turn her back. I don't know why I love her, but I love her. And I love old Bob Billings. I don't know why I love him, but I do. And I, I love old C.W. Fisk and John Colston and Ron Perky, and I don't know. And I love old Jack Hiles. I don't know why, but I do. Well, why don't you forgive him? I can't forgive him. My justice must be met. The price must be paid. And Jesus said, Father, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go to the cross and I'll take Ron Perky's sins and Hiles' sins and Billing's sins and Adam's sins and Eve's sins and the sins of all the world and I'll put them on my record and I'll dip my own soul into hell and pay the penalty for their sin. Oh, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. When God the Father turned His back on Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and Jesus Christ... Uh, looked up and said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I think it broke the heart of God to turn his back on Jesus. But I think while his heart was broken, I think God said, Hallelujah, I can take them all back now. I can have them all back now. My justice is satisfied. That's the thing we ought to glory in. Paul said, I glory in that. Paul said, nothing good about me, I just glory in the cross. But there's a second thing. It said, Paul said, I glory in the cross. Nothing save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified. And I mean, what does that mean? That means that while our Lord was being crucified on the cross, the world was dying to Paul. What do you mean? I mean, when Paul came to Christ, the world died. Boy, I wish I could get you there. I wish I could get you to the place where the world is dead. I wish. Listen, some of you ladies that sit home in the afternoon and watch one of these little soap harlotries operas after another. You just can't wait till the medics come on. Or, or I, I'm trying to think of them. I, I, I read the, news, the television schedule in a paper for this sermon. I forgot them now. Uh, Secret Storm. What are some of the rest of them, Don? As the world turns. <laughs> What's the one you watch after that? As the world turns. Do you know what? If you ever get a good old glimpse of the cross, now you listen to me. If you ever get a glimpse of the cross and ever one day walk with God, that'll be the deadest stuff you ever saw in your life. It'll die! And you'll look at it, Ron. If you could, if you could die, if you, if you'd ever, if you'd ever one time, and I'm just kidding you, of course. You don't watch that. You only watch the Carson show and other good pro, good Christian programs. But, one time, for tomorrow afternoon, you'd say, oh, I've got to be sure and get the, the ironing all, all, all done, and I've got to get it, be sure and get the, get the house all clean, and, and be sure and take the phone off the hook because the world's going to turn now. <laughs> and, and so you turn that little knob on, and boy, you just can't wait. And you say, I just wonder what's going to happen. I wonder which one she's going to run off with this time. And so you sit there, and, you, and, you, and all of a sudden you say, you know, it's not as good as it usually is. You know what happened? It died last night. The world died last night. That's what the Apostle Paul meant when he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I think it is, where he said, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Dead! This may come as a great shock to you. You folks say, You folks go to church all the time. Come back on Wednesday night and, and go to church all the time. One fellow said, I got one of your members lived next, next door to me. He said, He's never home. He's never home. And said, 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 <laughs> said, if we do go to church, we get home two hours before he does. He said, what are you folks seeing all that? I'll tell you what we see. 
we see in your life exactly what you see in ours. We drive by this little old tavern down here, little leap in, limp out place down here on, on Soul Street, and we look in there just like you look in here. I mean, we walk, we drive by and say, Good night! It's dead! Why? The world is dead! That's why Max, Max Helton, Max Palmer, stood up here a while ago and he said, I haven't wanted a bottle of liquor or whiskey since I got saved. You know why? The world died! He said, two days after I got saved, I quit smoking and have more than a cigarette since. The world died. Paul said, I glory in the cross. Jesus died for me there, but the world died to me there. Maybe he said, I went back to the world, but it wasn't. It was dead. I went back to the old crowd, but the old crowd was dead. I went back to the old habits, and the old habits were dead. I went back to the old drink, and the old drink was dead. I went back to the old literature, and the old literature was dead. Listen, once you ever get a taste, of walking with God. And if you ever just take one good glimpse of that cross, I want to say a word tonight. I probably shouldn't say it. I hardly ever mention the name, brag on folks in the pulpit in a sermon. There's a lady in this church, and I, I, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds, but I see her a lot around town. An awful lot. She moved to our city from Pontiac, Michigan. She's one of the simplest little ladies in this church. Her husband's in heaven. But I see her as I drive around town quite a bit. Mrs. Bartels. Mrs. Bartels. I don't know how many dresses she has. Maybe not over one or two. Most of the time I see her, she's wearing the same dress. Most of the time I see her, she's wearing the same coat. You know, her husband's gone. She lives alone, I guess. Maybe with somebody, but no, no family. She came here by herself. She came here because First Baptist Church is here. I don't think she'll decorate a Christmas tree this Christmas because nobody will be there to share it with her. I doubt she'll have any grandchildren or dancing around the tree opening presents this Christmas. But everywhere I see her, and she doesn't know I see her, she's got a smile on her face. Always does. Always does. And the people that have what they think makes them happy are all frowning and human, but she's always smiling. Always smiling. I saw her down the other day out visiting, out soul winning, down here on uh, Fayette Street. You know, I say, well, that poor thing. No, don't feel sorry for her. The world's dead to her. Well, you see, the world hasn't got a thing in the world to offer her. <laughs> Let's suppose that beagle dog that lives where we live were to die. Oh, happy day. <laughs> Let's suppose he were to die. Huh? And I woke up and I said, hey, hey, Tenny. That's for Tennessee. David was down to the ranch and they didn't give him a love offering and gave him a dog instead. And, and so I said, hey, Tenny. Tenny, hey, stand up. I want to give you a piece of meat. She just lays there. She's dead. Hey! Thought you liked meat. Meat doesn't appeal to her anymore. You know why? She's dead. She's dead. Did you know when you ever get to the place to where you just look at the cross and you just start, you just start taking things and, and doc, just put them in the garbage can. Say, you know what? I, I want to be an all-American football player, but I'm just going to put that in the garbage can. I want to be a Hollywood movie star. Well, you could be if Lassie dies. And, but just put it in the garbage can. I want to make a million dollars by the time I'm 40 years old. Just take it and put it in the garbage can. You go home and your folks will think you lost your mind. You may have to put your mom and dad in the garbage can. Now, don't go home tonight and put your mom and dad in the garbage can. I don't know what you're going to do. Last Sunday night, I said, I said, right after you get baptized, I said, you walk out the baptistry door and you find the devil's waiting for you. No, Bob Lee, I was right out there last Sunday night. So don't take me literally now. I said, sure enough, there's the devil outside the baptistry door. But you see, folks will think you lost your mind. Your dad's going to say, you going to do that? There's no money in that. See? And the world can, can just wave all the money she wants to in front of you. Doesn't matter. The world's dead. It's dead. It's dead. The other day, I was sick down in Birmingham, Alabama.
I was watching the news. I, all I did was stay in bed and, and, and groan and moan to the glory of God. And then the time came, 15 minutes before I preached. I mean, I didn't go for the service. I didn't hear the other fellows preach. I just crawled out of bed and the fellow came and got me and took me right to the pulpit. I leaned up against the pulpit and talked about it like this and preached. And then uh, during the, and I said, let's bow our heads for prayer. And while somebody was praying, I'd get out in the car and I'd be driven right back to the room. And so I, I turned on the news and I, was too, and I had a chill. And, uh, and I couldn't get out of bed. You know, you, you just move. And, and I, so, I, I just, so I was watching the news and the news went off and another program came on. It was a rerun of the Andy Griffith program. Back in the days when they had something halfway decent. Don Knotts, the only spiritual man that's ever been on television. <laughs> <laughs> that's back before I died. It's back before the world was crucified to me. But I, I watched that thing. And it's all right. And then, then a talk show came on. Young people, a talk show came on. And I've forgotten the guy's name. He's from Philadelphia. Um, uh, he's sort of a stocky fella. Comes from Philadelphia. What's, I mean, I'm not trying to trick you. What's his name? Mike Douglas. Yeah, Mike Douglas. And he had a bunch of guests on there. I mean, they were the real in crowd. This old gal walked out, and her dress was about that big around here and, and here. And, and then she, it wasn't a dress, it's pants. But, but when it got down to her ankles... Is about four feet in diameter on either leg. And she had barred some eyelashes off some corpse <clears throat> that didn't have the same color hair as she did. And she had glued them on with tar. And uh, she had taken walking lessons from a snake. And she had a hat on. The last time I saw one like it, Mama used to wear it for a sunbonnet years ago. And she came walking out there. She said, Hello, Mikey. And I thought, Good night. She must be a patron saint of Westville. And she puckered up to kiss him. And I thought, God give him grace to go through this. <laughs> I was sick, but I, I, I tell you what, I'd have been sicker if I had to kiss that. <laughs> you know, I, I lay there and, and watched that thing, and, and, and uh, my chills got worse. And I watched those idiots come out, one after the other. I mean, here came a fellow just written a book. And he, I say he had on blue jeans, he had off blue jeans. They're just, just the hip huggers. Well, they were just sort of thigh huggers. He came out, had long, shaggy hair, afro sort of hairstyle. Hell, man. And I, I thought, now, you reckon they really think that's the stuff? You know, you know what? I died to all that stuff. And that stuff died to me. The fellow said, said to us, did you ever think about drinking liquor? I, I said, I drink it. I drink every, every bottle of beer I want, I drink it. I mean, if I want a bottle of beer, just go down and drink it. Get it and drink it. I just never do want a bottle of beer. Why? Because it's dead. Hollywood's dead. When I passed by a movie theater, no joke, I walked by one. Where was I? Pasco, Washington. The day I was taking a little jog and, and, and jogged by a movie and looked in that thing. And I was thinking, I guess the only other thing in town I'd hate to go in more is a morgue. They're dead. Hollywood's dead. World is dead. Why? Listen. Like one <laughs> little Nazarene kid had never been to a picture show. He went to a picture show one night and he came home and he said, Mama, he said, if you ever went to a picture show, you'd never want to go to prayer meeting anymore. <laughs> now, he's got to just turn around. If you ever one day ever get a glimpse of Calvary and you ever one day really walk with God, you'll, you'll be amazed at how dead the old life will look. Paul said, I glory in the cross. Why? It, Jesus died there, but the world died there. 
Then he said something else. He said, and I was crucified to the world. By the way, here's one of the blessed things about, about, about when you get saved and you get a glimpse of the cross, you start living for God. You don't really have to worry a great deal about crucifying the, the world. They'll crucify you, you see. Fellas, I didn't have to give up the old crowd. I just said, praise the Lord, and they gave me up. You say, you don't have to worry about that. So Paul said, hallelujah, for the cross, Jesus died for me there. The world died to me there. And the world crucified me there. And brother, I want the world to crucify me. If the world doesn't crucify you, there's something wrong with your Christian testimony. Paul said, I died, by the way, he knew what he's talking about. Are you listening? He knew what he's talking about. Because when, a, when an Orthodox Jew gets converted and leaves Judaism, he, they actually have a funeral service for him. I mean, they have a casket and they bury him. And Paul was actually dead to his family. My good friend, Dr. Jacob Gartenhouse, a Jew, was saved on the streets of New York City. The day he got saved, he was stoned and left bloody on the streets of New York City because of his testimony for Christ. A Jewish man. His father's a rabbi in Jerusalem, or was. Ninety years of age, Dr. Gartenhouse was saved. His mother and father had a service and buried him. Funeral service. Jacob is dead, they said. Dr. Gartenhouse got burdened for his mom and dad. Got on a plane, flew across the ocean, flew all the way to Jerusalem. Got a cab, went to the home of his mother and dad. His mother came to the door. He had flown 6,000 miles, I guess. He said, Mama, this is Jacob. This is your son, Jacob. His mother said, You're not Jacob. Jacob is dead. We buried Jacob. He said, Mom, Mama, I'm Jacob. I'm, I'm your son, Jacob, from America. I'm Jacob. Mom, I'm Jacob. No, she said, Jacob is dead. We buried Jacob. She closed the door in his face and wouldn't even speak with him. He went down to the synagogue where his father was rabbi. He walked in the synagogue and said, Father, this is Jacob. I've come from America to tell you about Jesus. His rabbi father looked in the face of his son and said, Jacob is dead. Jacob is dead. We buried Jacob. He's dead. And Dr. Gartenhouse went back and got on the airplane without even his mother and father even taking him into the house. He came back to America. He prayed. He prayed. Got on the airplane and flew to Jerusalem again. Went down to the synagogue and his father was praying in the synagogue. Something had happened to his father. He said, Jacob, my son, Jacob, embraced him. And Dr. Gartenhouse knelt on the altar of the synagogue and told him about Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. His father got up off his knees and lifted his hands toward heaven and said, Ashua! Jesus! Jesus! He was in his 90s. Dr. Gartenhouse never saw him again. He went to heaven before. Dr. Gartenhouse saw him again. Why do not all that to say this? Jacob was dead. Jacob was dead. And Paul said, I'm dead to the world. I'm dead to the world. He wrote a letter to the Corinthian church and he gave some of the most beautiful words ever written. Second Corinthians chapter 6 when he said, As deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, I thought the other day when little Miss Bartell was out trying to get folks to come to church and it was snowing and she had no hat on and she had no car to drive. Nobody knew she was there I, except me, young people. Nobody knew she was there, but all of heaven knew she was there. Unknown yet well known. Dying, <laughs> and behold, we live. world says, boy, it sure looks dead to me. Oh, no, you just don't know what it is, brother. You take one glimpse of, of Calvary, and then you'll die to the world. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. <laughs> what does that mean? It means the world says, that, this sure looks sad. I can recall, Mama, when you take me to church. I'd sit beside you at 
Farnwood Baptist Church, and you'd begin, you'd begin to cry. You'd wipe a tear and begin to cry. And I'd say, Mama, what's wrong? She'd say, I'm happy. And I used to worry about Mama. She'd cry more. Pretty soon she was sobbing. And I'd say, Mama, Mama, what's wrong? She'd say, I'm getting happier. And I'd say, Mama sure has a strange way of being happy. Huh? We come to church and God speaks to our hearts and tears come out our eyes and the world says, here's a dead life. The Bible says we're always rejoicing. Here's little Phyllis Penton down here. Two foot ten. She says she's two foot ten. That's a big lie. She's not over twelve inches tall. I can tell. But I bind you one thing. I bind you there's not a Hollywood movie star half as happy as Phyllis Penton is tonight. You know why? She's dead. She's dead. I haven't died completely, but I want to. I want to. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. How does the world look to you tonight? You kids have to say, Boy, I wish I weren't a Christian so I could do that. Boy, I wish I could do that, but I can't because I go to Hammond Baptist High School. That's why a lot of you get out of school and shorten your skirts look like a bunch of Jezebels when you get out of school. That's why in the summertime, a bunch of our kids last summer decided to have a beach party. Our high school kids have a beach party. I said, you do, and every one of you will not, we'll go to some other school next fall. You're going to live outside school like you live inside the school. Don't you laugh at me while I'm preaching about that. It's time God's people decided that Jesus means more than a hippie communist kind of a haphazard world. It's time we got to the place to where we said, I just glory in the cross. I just glory in the cross. I'll close with this. If you glory when you have money, then you'll be sad when you're broke. If you glory when you're popular, you'll be sad when you're unpopular. If you glory when you're on top, you'll be sad when you're on the bottom. If you glory when you're well, you'll be sad when you're sick. If you glory in the sunshine, you'll never glory around here. You'll be sad when it's cloudy. But if you glory in the cross, you'll never know a dark or a sad day. And ask a question. Is Christ real to you?